It's always beautiful when we have programs with uh, multiple shuls in the community together. So I thank Rabbi Karuri and, uh, and the Jewish Center of Roslyn uh, and, and the Kahila for coming together to join us for this morning's uh, shir with, uh, with, um, with Mr. Harry Rothenberg. Um, the second thing is that being that today is a national holiday, it's Thanksgiving, so the things that we do when we are off technically, when we're on vacation, when we don't need to be at work, those are the things that really define us. Those are the things that really tell us what is at our core, at our neshama. And the fact that everyone came here this morning on a day off when we all have a lot of things to do today, whether you're going to go later to a Thanksgiving suda, right? <laughs> whatever you're going to do. Uh, but the fact that you came out to learn Torah on this morning, especially with everything going on in the world, it should be a zuchut for all of us. It should be a schus, a merit for all of us. And then, of course, we want to thank Chazak for arranging it. And on that note, it is my honor, before introducing our speaker for this morning, to introduce... Uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Aboff uh, of Chazak to uh, introduce the program. Come up here. Yeah, come on. Ooh, Rabbi, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi Dansger. We want to, um, on behalf of Chazak, we want to, of course, um, it's, it's, an, it's another great honor to do another program together, many more programs in the future. I'm in. Um, we we want to thank, of course, the Rosen Synagogue, I think it, uh, and, and uh, of course, Together, together with um, with the Jewish Center of Roslyn, Rabbi, Rabbi Karari, and of course, um, also we have the um, involved of Chana Mursky, who helped with, with getting Project Inspire, J Inspire of Roslyn to, to be involved. And I think that, of course, this octus and unity is always in, uh, it's important. But of course, right now we know what's going on in Eretz Israel, in the in the land of Israel. So if, if to have to have people of all, all backgrounds, Ashnaz and Sephardim, and different shuls, organizations, all united under, under, under one roof. I think it's, it's, it's such a beautiful thing. And um, of, of, of course, um, we want, want to just give a quick word about the Chazak organization, which is, there's actually three programs going on right now. Um, on, on this morning, there's the program in, in, uh, in Queens and in Brooklyn. And of course, an amazing event right here in, in Roslyn. And we have a... Uh, um, in, in, in Rabbi Karari Shul, we, have, we even have a, a Sunday school program for public school students, and we have that, that, pro, um, that Sunday school program in 15 different locations. We're on the forefront of different public school outreach programs to give them a Jewish education. So, of course, anyone knows of anyone who has children in public school, they should reach out to Chazak, myself, or obviously Rabbi Dansger, they can connect us. And um, of, of course, um, we, um, it's, our, it's, our, it's our great, uh, let's, let's call back Rabbi Dansger, give him a round of applause for all the amazing work that's for the community. So, Okay, I'm just, I'm just the, uh, the MC, so save your applause because we have a tremendous opportunity this morning uh, with Mr. Harry Rothenberg, uh, who is here, Esquire. Uh, I'm just going to read the blurb from the, uh, from the, from the, the sign. Uh, Magna cum laude graduate of Harvard Law School, Harry is best known for his success in the courtroom. On behalf of victims of catastrophic injury, Harry is equally passionate about speaking on Jewish topics and sought after lecturer for his crowd-pleasing talks. I have to tell you, even just preparing for this, uh, for, this, uh, for this event this morning, I had an opportunity to speak to him on the phone for a little bit. He's a pleasure to speak to. He's very, very funny, and he's full of Torah content. A real something, especially on a day off from work, uh, to be able to see someone who is engaged in the, you know, in, in, the, in the world of Parnassa as a lawyer, but also is so, so involved in the Torah world and, and showing how we can use our kochos, our, 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 our efforts, and our Judaism, even in the workplace. And without further ado, it is my honor and privilege to call Mr. Harry Rothenberg to speak this morning. Morning. Happy Thanksgiving. Um, thank you to the uh, rabbi uh, for the introduction and to the rabbi and the, and the shul, the shuls, um, for setting this up and to Chazak. Um, Rabbi took care of the individual thank yous, but I don't want to echo those. And thank you to each of you uh, for coming out today. I don't take it for granted that you are spending a day off uh, to listen to some words. So um, by way of brief background and biography, uh, I grew up in Philadelphia. Um, so I apologize if there are any fans of teams that, uh, you know, that, that don't like us. Um, if you're a football fan, you know why I'm in a good mood this week. Um, We're going for a draft pick. <laughs> exactly. Good, good luck with that. Okay. Uh, I went to day school in Philadelphia from first to 12th grades. Jewish day school meant, as many of you know, many of you went through this, half the day was secular subjects. That was the second half of the day. Half the day was Hebrew subjects. The second half of the day, I could not have loved it more. I was such a geek. Such a nerd. I loved it. I loved English and math and science and social studies. The morning, not so much. I used to sit 
and I wanted to bang my head against the wall. I just was bored, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you. I would sit and I would stare at the clock and hope that my, I used to read a lot of comic books when I was younger, that my mutant powers would kick in and, and I'd be able to like, like concentrate and make the, the minute hand move closer to recess just so I can get out of there. And finally, 12th grade, I got out of there and that was it for my Jewish studies. Started my college career at the University of Pennsylvania and that was the last time, at least for a while, that I saw a folio of the Talmud or a passage in the Torah. Um, I transferred to Columbia for my junior year, and then during my junior year, I applied to and was accepted to Harvard Law School. And I accepted the acceptance, and I said to myself at some point in time during junior year, you know, I gotta figure out this whole Jewish thing, because every other area of my life is 110%, everything that I'm doing, my academic studies and sports and, and dating, whatever, whatever else I'm doing. And my Jewish thing is more like Jew-ish, right? Not Jewish. So I gotta, I gotta check this out, right? And so I decided to defer for a year. So I, I convinced the, uh, it wasn't that difficult to convince Harvard Law School to give me a year off, no problem. Went to a place called Ur Sameach in Israel and loved it. First time that I was treated like an adult, able to make my own decisions. Ur Sameach in, in, in Jerusalem, in Yerushalayim. I was able to convince Harvard to defer for a second year. I spent two years there, came back much, much more serious about my Judaism. Um, I had uh, continued long distance, dating a young woman who I had met in college. Uh, she was from New York, I'm from Philadelphia. I took her to a Sixers-Knicks game. Suddenly, middle of the first quarter, up on the board during a timeout, the board, the giant board said, the screen said, Amy, will you marry me? Question mark, Harry. She turned to me and she said, are you serious? I said, it sure looks like I'm serious. And she said, yes, and thank God, you know, uh, many children and, uh, and grandchildren later were still going strong, you know, uh, uh, 33 years uh, plus now. So um, after we got married, I started at law school and then spent uh, three years there, had our first two kids, then deferred my first job for a year, uh, went back to Israel for a year with our, with our first two children, came back, started working in big firm practice, and then after a few years, my father convinced me to join the family business. Uh, we represent people who are injured in serious accidents, and so I'll warn you in advance that some of my stories involve people getting hurt very badly. I'll try to avoid um, most of the gory details, but I have to go through some of them in order to tell the stories. So now you have my background, you can understand the setting, you'll understand where I was, when I saw and realized that there could be a conflict between my chosen profession, law, and my desire now after yeshiva to be very publicly, visibly Jewish in the workplace. When I say visibly Jewish in the workplace, for me, you know, I have this fashion accessory. Notice it's black so it matches any combination of suit, tie, casual, formal, I can wear anything with it, right? But I don't wear it just as a fashion statement. I wear it to tell the world, you know, I'm, I'm serious about this whole religious thing. Like there's a, there's a God up above. It can mean a lot of different things, right? For a woman, it can mean dressing modestly. For a man or a woman, it can mean telling somebody this time of year, you know, it's a Friday, I need to leave at two o'clock. Two o'clock? Yeah, the, the, for Shabbat. By the way, if you leave at two o'clock for Shabbat, that means you're staying late Thursday night, okay? You don't get to work four and a half days a week. What do you mean? I'm observant, I have to leave early. That's great, leave early, but you gotta make up the time. If you're supposed to work till five, you left three hours early, make it up, okay? So now, I have just gotten married, I finished my two years in Israel, very serious about my Judaism, and now I'm back into my secular career. First day, first class at Harvard Law School. I walk in, and the professor says, welcome to Harvard Law School. He says, how many of you have seen the movie or the TV show Paper Chase? Every single hand goes in the air. He says, how many of you have read the books 1L by Scott Turow? Every hand goes in the air. For those who don't remember, Paper Chase, famous movie, then a TV show about Harvard Law School. The star was a professor, um, and he would, he would call on people and then completely humiliate them. And it was a very popular movie and show because what's more fun than watching someone else get humiliated, right? I mean, we can admit that, guilty pleasure. Scott Turow's first book before he became famous for writing legal thrillers was 1L. It chronicled his experience as a first year law student at Harvard Law School. College is fresh person, sophomore, junior, senior. Law school is 1L, 2L, three years, three years. So 1L was what it was like when he was there for his first year. And during that year, he told, over, he told over some heartwarming moments about how on the first day of class, the professor looked at three people and he said, I want the three of you to look at each other because by the time we get to graduation, only one of you is still going to be here, okay? It used to be like that. People would flunk out. He says, I want you to know there may well have been a time when it was like that here. It no longer is. We're here not just to educate you. At times, we may even entertain you and relax we are not here to intimidate you, to embarrass you, or to humiliate you. And you could like feel in the room like, 
Okay, that sounds better than what we saw on TV and what we read in the books. Okay, great. He says, however, we are going to use the Socratic method. It's named after Socrates. I'm going to ask a question. Then I'm going to call on a guinea pig. I mean a volunteer, and that person's going to give me an answer. Then I'm going to ask another question. Okay, back and forth, back and forth. He's okay. Let's begin. Now, in college, for those of you who went, you know that the first day of classes is a meet and greet. Nothing happens, okay? Let's go around the room. Everybody tell me what you did over the summer and what you want to accomplish this semester. Let's go through the syllabus. Nothing, okay? In law school, before your first class, you've been assigned 50, 60 pages of cases. You've been expected to read them and brief them and be ready to answer questions about them. I had some other professors. I remember one professor in particular. She's a little more famous now than she was then. She just walked in the class first day and started calling on people, okay? Back then, she was Professor Elizabeth Warren. Now she's Senator. We had no idea she was Native American. We found that out later. By the way, phenomenal professor, incredible professor, okay? It's the type of talent that we had there in the law school, okay? So he says, okay, let's begin. Now, he's about to ask the first question of my legal career. And I say to myself, wait a minute. I've been in yeshiva the last two years. I have not been in an academic setting in two years. And this is Harvard Law School. I do not want to be the first guy called on, okay? So what do I do? I'll tell you what I didn't do, was I don't make eye contact, because I'm worried if I make eye contact, I might look eager, then he might call me, so I'm just looking at my notebook. There were some students there who I'm sure wanted to be the first person called on. There was a guy I used to see playing basketball in the gym. He was a 3L when I was a 1L. He was a third year student, he was a couple years ahead of me. Not a bad basketball player. Stupidly, for whatever it was worth, I never thought to take my basketball and a Sharpie and ask him, do me a favor, could you just autograph my basketball? If I had, I would have had a basketball autographed by a future president, of the United States of America. I didn't know that that guy, Barry Obama, that he used to see in the gym was gonna become president of the US, okay? That's the type of students you have. Maybe Obama had his hand up in the air. I don't know, I do not wanna be called on. I'm sitting in the second row and I'm looking down at my notebook and for no money am I lifting up my head. And he says, okay, who can tell me what did the Wilson court say about non-mutual, defensive, Collateral estoppel, okay, for the non-lawyers, lawyer mumbo jumbo, but we know what it meant because we had read the cases, okay? And I see he has stopped, I can see looking down, his shadow is over my notebook and I'm thinking, this may not end well, okay? And he says, okay, how about you, Mr. Jew? Jew. Mr. Jew, I'm wearing my yarmulke and the earth literally opens up and I fall and I'm like, I can't believe it. He gave us that whole speech. He's not gonna embarrass us. And he calls me Mr. Jew because I have a yarmulke on my head. And isn't that discrimination? How's he even allowed to do that? And I'm thinking like, I don't even remember what the question was. When all of a sudden, thank God, the guy sitting directly in front of me starts answering the question, an Asian fellow, Thomas Jew, J-O-O. <laughs> Now, I admit, okay, <laughs> to quote the passage in the Torah, I, I confess my sins today. During the two seconds it took Tom Jew, great guy, by the way, to clear his throat and start answering the question, I absolutely regretted my decision. I was thinking to myself, why'd you have to wear your yarmulke on the first day? You could have worn your Phillies hat, your Eagles hat, your Sixers hat, your Flyers hat. Why'd you have to wear it? That was the first and last time that I ever felt that in my career. That was the fall of 1990. It's been a while now, first and last time. I have had countless situations where I'm proud and proud and proud and prouder. I remember the very first case I had that settled for many, many, many millions of dollars. I went to a court conference and a very subtle Jewish law issue actually had come up on the case. Very subtle, you have to invite me back to describe it because it'll take me too long. Very nuanced issue. And I walk into the courtroom, I'm wearing a yarmulke. The judge is wearing a yarmulke. Very informal in New York State Court. The defense attorney is an Irishman. The judge looks at me as we approach his bench. He says to me, you know, you have, a, you have an issue here. I said, what do you mean? He says, you know what I mean. You know, you have a, you, did you ask a Shiloh? I said, yeah. He said, what was the Psak? I said, mutter, okay? The lawyer was look, like, what is, what is going, what are they having a private conversation in another language, okay? He turns to the other lawyer and he goes, we're just discussing the Talmud, okay? We walk out of court after the conference and the lawyer says to me, he goes, what was up with that between you and the judge? I said, we were discussing the Talmud, okay? He goes, I gotta tell you something, Rothenberg. If I had known that the judge was wearing one of those beanies, I would have worn one also. I said, Jim, that's the difference between me and you. I did my homework on this case. Why do you think I'm wearing this thing on my head, okay? So sometimes it can be funny, but many, many other times you can learn lessons. I wanna go through with you some cases and some lessons to tease out, particularly in the situation in which we find ourselves today, which 
you know, I can tell you, and I think we can all agree, I certainly haven't lived through, I don't think any of us have ever lived through anything like what we're living through today with what's going on in Israel and in the rest of the world. So um, many years ago, I represented, I got involved in the following case. A woman was taking her evening power walk in Manhattan, and note the story, because when I tell it over these days, people say, well, what about the cameras? There were no cameras. This was many, many, many years ago. And the little man turns white, which tells her she can now cross the street. Now remember, when the little man turns white, that means the light is green. So cars parallel to her heading in the same direction can also proceed. Of course, we all know, I hope we all know, that if you're gonna make a left turn, make sure there are no pedestrians in the crosswalk. What we believe to have been a bus, based on an eyewitness, makes a left turn, so he's coming, if you can picture this, from over her right shoulder. She presumably never sees him. Makes a left-hand turn, hits her, kills her, and keeps going. Hit and run. There's an eyewitness. He tells the police officer it was a bus. Yeah. Who am I suing? What bus? What was it? Was it Academy? Was it Greyhound? Was it Peter Pan? Was it the city of New York? Was it some private company? What bus? I don't know. It was a bus. That's it. Okay? Let me tell you the difference. Here's the difference under New York law. If we don't find that bus, the only thing we can do is they happen to have a car in Manhattan, which is rare, her and her husband. So they had an insurance policy. And on their insurance policy, it had something called uninsured slash underinsured motorist coverage. Go back home today, go check your policies. You wanna buy as much as that as you can afford. It's the most important coverage you can buy for this situation. So if we don't find the bus, that's now an uninsured case. They could bring a case against their own policy. $250,000 worth of coverage. Not bad, but that's it. $250,000 worth of coverage, okay? By the way, if we settle it for 250, the way I work as a contingent fee lawyer is I don't bill by the hour, I work on a third. My firm gets one third fee. So interestingly, I can divide any number by three. Here's what's strange. The bigger the number, the quicker I can do it. I'm not sure why that is. It's just, you know, it is, okay? So $250,000, my fee's gonna be $83,333. I'll do the math for you, okay. If we find the bus, and it's a bus company, bus companies have tons of coverage. Why? Because they know that when a bus hits a person, the bus usually wins, right? So if I find that bus, they're gonna have millions and millions of dollars worth of coverage. Here's what I can ask for. I can ask you, ladies and gentlemen on the jury, to award the following to her husband. I can ask you to award an amount to compensate for her conscious pain and suffering, the amount of time she was conscious and in pain. Wouldn't have been a long time. She was dead at the scene, but she wouldn't have died instantaneously. There would have been some hit, some extreme pain. I can ask you to award an amount for her husband's loss of consortium. He lost his wife. And I can ask you to award pecuniary loss, fancy term for lost wages. At the time, she was working on a street in Manhattan, lower Manhattan, you may have heard of, called Wall Street. Anybody ever hear that street? Trading bonds making a million dollars a year. 42 years old. So let's just, I don't wanna be greedy. Can I ask you for 20 years worth of lost wages? Forget bonuses, forget raises, just a million dollars for 20 years. Does that sound reasonable? $20 million? And can you add a million dollars for the pain and suffering and the husband's loss of consortium? Very conservatively, $21 million. What's my fee gonna be on that case? Seven million bucks. Anybody wanna do that deal? Okay, right? Let's do the deal, you know, 83,000 versus $7 million, okay? I want that $7 million, all right. All I need is which bus company, okay? So I send investigators out, they speak to me, he's like, I don't know, it was a bus. Now don't you think I could have gone myself to speak to this fellow, the eyewitness, man to man, mano a mano, sat down and looked at him, in his place. You know, I represent the husband of the woman whom you saw get killed, and you're his only hope. You're the only person who could tell us which bus company. Don't you think I would have been able to convince him? And the answer is no. I sent an ex-FBI agent to interrogate him. He either didn't know or didn't want to cooperate. But what if I had sat down with him man to man and said, sir, isn't there any way that I can refresh your recollection? Isn't there anything I can do to, to help you remember? Isn't there some way, somehow, something that would help you? You tell me, okay? The guy did not live in a nice area in, in New York, right? How much would I have had to put in an envelope? $1,000, three grand, five grand, 10 grand. I guarantee you for 10 grand, the guy would have sworn on a stack of Bibles, you could have gone into the synagogue and taken them out, okay? It was, pick one, Academy bus, right? So let's do the deal. Give me 10 grand, I'll give you back seven million. It's not a bad deal. Very, very tempting. Matter of fact, I had a friend, fellow lawyer. I ran it by him. He said, you know what? I'm thinking, let's do the case together. I'll go talk to him. In other words, he'll go schmear him, right? I said, you're not going and I'm not going. Why? So I want to tell you why. So number one, I didn't do that because I knew there's going to be a deposition. And at the deposition, he's going to be asked, so you told the police officer bust and you told Rothenberg Academy what happened, right? Now hopefully he's going to say, I remembered. 
right? I paid good money for this testimony, 10 grand, okay? But what if he says, you know, I, I just, I can't lie. Rothenberg gave me 10 grand to say it was Academy. What happens? Okay, so number one, I have violated a very significant halacha, right? We are not allowed to lie or pay other people to lie or cheat or steal. Number two, I'm gonna get suspended from the practice of law or disbarred. Number three, I'm going to disgrace my firm because they're gonna have in there Harry Rothenberg, Rothenberg Law Firm. And number four, when they write that article, I guarantee you, they're not going to have a picture of me wearing my softball uniform on a Sunday morning. They're gonna have a picture of me that they took this morning with my talus on and my tefillin on, maybe even holding a Torah. Rothenberg, the Jewy, Jewy, Jewish lawyer, pays somebody to lie, okay? That's gonna be the story. And you know that, I don't have to show you, I can give you a hundred examples of that. They're gonna find out. And people sometimes when I tell this over, they'll say, well, so maybe I should hide my, instead of wearing my yarmulke, maybe I'll, I'll hide my, you know, my mug and dove it or my chai, you know, et cetera. They will find out. And I'm telling you that right now, as I stand here today, we have an opportunity to represent the Jewish people like we never have before. Because you are gonna find, you're gonna sit next to somebody on a plane or on a train, you're gonna have colleagues, Israel's gonna come up and you have an opportunity to either shut up and say nothing, oh, maybe, and then say afterwards, oh, I, I, I should have said something, okay? In French, they call that l'esprit d'escalier. It's literally the whisperings of the, of the staircase. I mean, you think of something you could have said or should have said when you're, you know, afterwards, when you're leaving. Or you could say, excuse me, let's talk about that, okay? You have an opportunity to represent. And in general, anytime you've got that situation, we've got an opportunity to do something wrong that's gonna disgrace the Jewish people. It's not just you, it's the Jewish people. Or you've got an opportunity to burnish our reputation, use the opportunity. When I travel on a plane, if I'm wearing a baseball cap, I'm an obnoxious Philly fan, okay? When I'm wearing a yarmulke, which is often, I almost make an announcement, excuse me, does anybody need help lifting your bags up on top? You know, it might be, and I'll do that, right? Because it's an opportunity. And you see people are so thankful, right? Holding doors, just the little things, at least convince them, you know what? If there's, so the next time when there's the anti-Semitic canard about those genocidal Israelis, et cetera, at least they'll know that, you know, I, it, I did meet that one Jew who was very nice today. We have constant opportunities to represent the Jewish people in a good way, increasing, burnishing our reputation, bettering our reputation, or in a bad way, and bringing it down, which is the last thing we want to do these days, okay? Next story. I represented a woman who was um, jogging along the West Side Highway on the jogging path, and then after she finished her jog, she's now going to cross the bicycle path. The bicycle path has many different ways that it tells bicyclists to yield to pedestrians. It's written on, the, if you've ever ridden on that bike path, it's written on the, on the sidewalk, yield to pedestrians. There are signs, standing signs, and then there are overhanging signs, yield to, but yield to, let you know, there, there are people crossing all the time, okay? She crosses and gets wiped out by a bicyclist. Full leotard, helmet, you know, goggles, et cetera, okay? There's no eyewitness, there's what I call an ear witness. There's a woman who tells the police officer, I heard the sound of her head hitting the, uh, you know, the, the asphalt, okay? She ends up with a mild traumatic brain injury. What does that mean? No skull fracture, her MRIs are negative. If you'd meet her, you'd say, you know, she seems okay, but she tries to go back to work and she can't go back to work, had a very decent job working on uh, building websites. She's not able to go back to work, young woman in her early 30s. And we file a lawsuit against a bicyclist who happens to be wealthy, has a lot of insurance coverage. And his lawyers send it to their doctors and their doctors, as always happens in a mild traumatic brain injury case, say she is faking it. She is exaggerating. She is malingering. She is lawsuiting, to use the slang term, meaning she's faking injury in order to try to get money, okay? And remember, the way it happened, although he has many signs telling him yield to pedestrians, she did cross in front of him, right? She's going in front of him, so why didn't she see him, right? And Mazel Tov, thank you very much. She remembers nothing. She can't even say anything because she has retrograde amnesia because of the hit, right? Okay, so what that means is there is a huge range as to possible outcomes if we go to trial on this case. A jury may believe her, and give her millions of dollars. Or jury may believe her, their, his doctors and give her the hole in a bagel. Give her 50 grand and let her walk, okay. So for two years or three years, we're litigating this case and the defense attorney is saying to me, we will never pay you a nickel. Your client is a fraud, a fake. She's crazy, I'll give you that. But she's absolutely a fraud, okay. We finally get a trial date. After we get a trial date, the guy's been telling me for two or three years, we'll never pay you a nickel, calls me up and he says, you wanna go to a mediation? 
So you should go to mediation. Mediation means you go typically in front of a retired judge who tries to bring both sides together, tells me you're too high, brings me down, tells them you're too low, brings them up. And if you come to a number that matches, you have a settled case. Okay. I know that she can never make up her mind. I believe because of a brain injury. They believe because she's just crazy. It's their defense. So I spend, starting about a month before the mediation, I spend time with her. You know what? Let's talk it through because they're going to want an answer at the mediation. So I go through the different scenarios and I say to her, here's my advice. Remember, you make the decision. You're the client. My advice is that if they offer you anything under a million dollars, I want to walk out. If they offer you a million five, my fee's a third, put aside costs so as not to complicate it, you're going you're gonna to clear about a million dollars. I think that's too much to risk. I would not take a million dollars and put it on red in Atlantic City or in Las Vegas. I think you should take it. Between a million and a million five, whatever you think. If you want to take it, I'm fine with that. If you want to go forward, I'm fine with that. So just think about it, okay? I'll think about it. I call her a couple days later. She says, can we go through that again? I go through all of it again, okay? Okay, let me think about it. I call her a week later. Did you decide? Can we go through it again? I go through it again. It's going on for weeks. Finally, it's a few days before I say, you know, it's coming up in a few days. Did you decide? She says, yes. I said, great. What did you decide? She says, I decided. I agree with you. I said, meaning? She says, a million five, I'm going to settle my case. I said, okay. And if it's a million four, a million three, a million two, five, a million one, she says, that I don't know. Okay. What am I going to do? Right? I got to try to get a million five. Okay. We go into the mediation in front of the retired judge. We start at nine in the morning. And anybody ever been to Shul and Simchas Torah, you know what it's like selling Aliyahs, right? It's kind of similar, right? A hundred, looking for 150, 150, 200, 200. Do I have 250, 250, looking for three, 350. I have four, I have 475, 500, 750, 800, 950, looking for a million. We get to the magic million dollar number and we cross it. We get to a million one. A million two, a million two five, a million two seven five, a million three, a million three five. The judge comes in, very well respected judge whom I knew well. I'd been in front of him quite a few times, and he says, "Harry, I got the last number. That's it. I cannot get another dollar." Yeah, a million four. No, I said, "Your Honor, I need a few more dollars." He said, "I can't get another dollar." I said, "Can I talk to them?" He says, "Let me go ask them. It's a mediation. You know, it's up to them." He goes in, speak to the lawyer, and the adjuster is actually more than one adjuster because he had different layers of coverage. He says, they said they'll talk to you. I'm not going to give you another dollar. I go in to talk to them. So I'm talking to the defense lawyer. Really, I'm really talking to the adjusters, but I want to talk to the defense lawyer because he's the one with whom I have a relationship. And I say, listen, we've been litigating against each other for, what, three years now? You told me how many times you'll never pay me? This is certainly good faith. You made a good faith offer. He says, oh, we sure have. We're overpaying. Great. Okay. I said, I want you to understand. We both know she can't make up her mind. Remember when we were scheduling depositions, she changed her mind 10 different times. Remember when she showed up with like three different coffee cups, one was black, one had sugar, one had milk. She can't make up her mind. For the last month, I've been working on getting her to a number that will settle the case. We are so close, okay? He's like, okay, Harry, enough. What's the number? All right, so I tell him. Well, I'm going by <laughs> oh, I'm sorry? Two, two. Okay, I tell him one point. I told him 1.6. Why did I tell him 1.6? Because there was a very famous person in Jewish history, the wisest man who ever lived, his name is King Solomon. And very often in cases, when you get to 1.5 and 1.4, King Solomon enters the room with a sword. He's like, okay, where's the baby? I'm ready to cut it in half, okay? <laughs> so I'm worried if I tell him 1.5, they're going to come back. All right, 1,450,000. I need 1.5. So I tell them 1.6. Split the baby. I got my 1.5. I guess I was convincing. They come back in. They huddle again for like half an hour. They come back in. 1.6. Fantastic, okay? I walk back in, I'm like, congratulations, guy, we're settled. She goes, well, I said, 1.6. She says, how much time do I have to decide? I said, one second, you told me you're gonna settle for 1.5, this is 1.6, it's more than one. She says, I, I just wanna call my father. No problem, okay, great. She says, could you excuse me? I step out of the room. Wait about 10 minutes, peek my head in, she says, I'm on the phone now with my brother. I wait another 10 minutes, I pick my head and okay, just talking to my sister. I'm like now it's like almost a half an hour, I gotta go back in, right? So I walk back in, they're like, Harry, we're, we're good? I said, we're good, she just, she's just making a few phone calls. They're like, whoa, 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 what's going on? You told us what? I said, we're really good, she's just making a few phone calls, we're fine, okay. This is going on about 4, 4.30. At five o'clock, the judge says to us, listen, guys, we've been here since 9 a.m., I've done everything I can do. I've written up the settlement agreement, you could stay all night if you need to. If she takes it, settle it, sign it, Make copies, leave me a copy, you each take a copy. If she doesn't, rip it up, okay? 5.30, 6 o'clock, 6.30. At 7 o'clock, I kid you not, she's taking a nap. She's taking a nap. I now have to go in and tell the lawyer and these two adjusters that have been here since 9 a.m. that my client is taking a nap, okay? One of them says something that I cannot repeat in a synagogue or outside of a synagogue, okay? The other one says, maybe she'll wake up refreshed and ready to settle. I was like, yeah, exactly, okay? At about eight or so, she wakes up. 8.30, she's on the phone again. And at 9 p.m., 12 hours after we started, she says, I'm gonna settle. Okay, great. 
I go into the other room, I tell them, first and only time in my career, I believe I hugged the defense attorney, okay? I mean, 12 hours, <laughs> mazel tov, okay? We have a settled case, I'm driving home. I call my wife, she says, please tell me you settled the case. I said, I settled the case. You still have dinner, she goes, it's cold, but I can heat it up, okay? Great, all right? While I'm driving home, I say to myself the following. You never know why something happens to you. We do not ever know why, ever know why God does something. We don't know, okay? You want proof of this? Go to the Megillah. When Mordechai is trying to convince Esther to go into the king, he says to her, and who knows? Maybe this is why you're the queen. Who knows? She's the queen. She's Jewish. Her husband, the king, has signed the death warrant for the Jews. Who knows? Mordechai is telling us, you never know 100% why God's doing something, okay? On the other hand, to the extent you can learn a lesson, try to learn a lesson. I said to myself, you know, I could have the case settled at 4 o'clock. Why did I spend another five hours? Maybe God was sending me a message. I said to myself, you know, I know what the message is. I know exactly what the message is, okay? Every morning, you can come over to my house and you can see this in action, okay? Not that I'm bragging, it's just, you know, I'm very proud of this ability. I go to prayers. After prayers, I have my Talmudic study session. Afterwards, I come back home and I open the kitchen cabinet, the pantry. And we always have six or seven boxes of cereal. They're all open because my kids will open every single box. They can't ever finish one then go to the next one. You should see how quickly I make decisions. I don't know how I do it. I walk in, Honey Nut Cheerios today. The next day, cornflakes. The next day, regular Cheerios, okay? Instantaneous decisions. Maybe God was telling me, you know what? You take it for granted you can make decisions. Look at her, she can't make a decision, okay? That's my lesson, great, I feel good about that, very nice, hakara satov, gratitude to God, I got my lesson. I go to sleep that night, I wake up the next morning and my first thought is, you are such a coward talking to myself. I'm like, really, really, that's the lesson? I have an office full of people who have lost sight, lost the ability to walk, lost the ability to eat, lost the ability to think. That's the lesson, okay? My dear friend and colleague Howard Hershenhorn and I are here. We worked on a case together where a woman lost all four limbs, okay? Two arms and two legs. That's the lesson. Be thankful you can choose your Cheerios. Maybe the lesson was the exact opposite. And I didn't want to admit it. Maybe the lesson was this, okay? Every one of us, You'll tell me, no, I'm not so religious. You're more religious. We're all religious. People say to me, what do you mean we're all religious? I'm like, we're all religious. Okay, did you murder anybody today? No. Did you drink blood today? No. Okay, well, that's in the Torah. We observe that. Okay, maybe I observe a couple more things, right? Right. But every one of us, at whatever our level is, we always have moral dilemmas. Should I give my 10% or more to charity? Or if I'm giving my 10%, should I give more? The rabbi said you could give up to 20%, okay? Should I put on my tefillin today? Should I have a Shabbat meal today? Should I, st should I sign up to study an hour of Torah? If I'm already studying an hour, should I study an hour a day instead of an hour a week? We all have these moral, you know, I usually try to keep Shabbat, not drive, but I got Rolling Stones tickets, okay? Whatever it is, okay? We all have our dilemmas. When that dilemma happens, right? And I've got them also. I do, you know, I, I once had a conversation with a, with, a, uh, with, a, with a friend, you know, who was not observant, said to me, you know, I'm so jealous of you. I said, why? So you, because you don't have, you don't have, you know, any, any uh, you know, desires. He's like, what are you talking about? He's like, what do you, what do you, what do you, well, you're, you know, you're religious. I said, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because you should just realize you shouldn't be jealous because it's so tough for me to go to sleep at night. Why? I said, well, you know, because since I'm an angel, I have these wings. And so, like, I can't sleep on my back. I can't sleep on my side. Okay. I was like, what are you talking? I got the same desires anybody has, right? You got to work on it. We all have desires. When that happens and you got a desire to do something you know you shouldn't do, or not to do something you know you shouldn't do, and that voice, the little devil starts, right? I'm not going to mention the movie, okay? Starts whispering in your ear. Maybe I'm supposed to not say, oh, I'm glad I'm not like her. Maybe God's saying, be more like her. Say to that little voice, little devil, how much time do I have to decide? No, I need to do it right now. Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Or don't do it, don't do it. No, 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 I, I just want to call my dad. Don't, you don't need to call your dad. Nah, can, 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 excuse me, can you step out of the room? I got to call my dad. Uh, did you make your decision yet? I need to know now. I, I gotta call my sister. I gotta call my brother. I gotta call my friend. I gotta call my rabbi. Maybe that was the lesson. Maybe the lesson was be more like her, okay? Stop, think, don't rush into it. When you're rushing, and you'll notice that sometimes, when you're doing something wrong, you're in a rush to do it. That's that voice, right? I need to know right now, right now, right now, right now. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. No, you don't need to know right now. It's okay. You know what? Maybe I'll do that sin tomorrow. Maybe I'm not gonna do it today. Okay, and if ever there is a time, A month or so ago, you know, right after it happened, the Shabbat after it happened, after the massacres and the kidnappings, my, uh, the rabbi um, in the synagogue where I, the shul, where I pray Shabbat mornings, um, he got up and he said, um, did anybody lose a, uh, a loved one last week? Nobody raised their hand. He said, did anybody um, have a relative um, kidnapped? 
Nobody raised their hand. He said, does anybody have a relative who's uh, in the army, you know, who's ready to go into Gaza? Few people raised their hands, I raised my hand. Um, he says, you know what the problem is? He says, the problem is every single one of you should have raised your hand for all three questions. We say, Achenu kol beis Yisroel. He says, you don't think it'll make a difference in your prayers if you think of the hostages as your brothers, your sisters, your mothers, your fathers, your sons and your daughters, okay? My wife's first cousin with whom she's very close. Her son, two days ago, just finished basic training, went into Gaza, okay? I mean, these are our, whether you have a family relationship or not, you have a family relationship. And that's the time, you know what? I don't usually fill in the blanks. I don't always light Shabbat candles. You know what? I'm gonna do it. Let, maybe it'll be, a, it'll be some help in heaven to protect the soldiers. I don't always put on tefillin. I got that pair, you know, from my bar mitzvah. I don't usually, I, of course I put on my tefillin, but I don't always make it to synagogue. You know, I don't usually study any, any Jewish topics. Do something and have in mind, you know. And by the way, he gets it and it counts. When you say that, there's no better time to pray. God, you know how badly I want to do this sin. God, you know how badly I don't want to give this charity, okay? I'm doing it, and I want this to be a zechut, a schus, a merit for the people who need it. The captives, the wounded, the people mourning, and the soldiers, okay? Let's think about that. Last story. It's a difficult one to tell over. Um, back in the 1970s, there was this radical group in Philadelphia called MOVE. They were, I think counter-revolutionaries. I don't know what the revolution was, I don't know what they were countering, but they basically took over a neighborhood in Philadelphia and they would walk around in like combat fatigues, they had assault rifles and wouldn't let anybody in or out of their, this, this apartment building that they had um, and they were terrorizing the neighborhood, they had megaphones all hours of the day and night shouting obscenities. Italian mayor in Philadelphia, Frank Rizzo, was like, well, what is this, give me a break, just send in the SWAT team. Sent in the SWAT team, kicked in the front door, you know, a couple of uh, broken bones, maybe there's some police brutality lawsuits, but that was it, they're gone. 10 years later, they're back. Move two. Who was that saw this and said, oh, this is a really good idea. We're going to do this, okay? Now, same thing. Terrorizing the neighborhood. New mayor, Wilson Good. And the neighborhood is in the middle of one of his voting blocks. It's an African-American neighborhood. And he's like, you know what? I didn't like that the last time. I don't like the optics. Mostly white SWAT guys and mostly African-Americans, you know, on the other side. Just come up with a different plan. I'm not sending in a SWAT team. To this day, no one will take ownership of whose idea this was or who blessed it, but someone came up with the idea and someone blessed it. The city of Philadelphia sent a police helicopter, came down just over the roof, dropped military explosives on the roof in order to start a fire. They started a fire. The police started a fire in the building. Why? So that they would run out of the building because it's much easier to arrest people who are running out of a burning building than it is to go into the building, get into hand-to-hand -hand combat with people who are armed. It works perfectly fire, they run out of the building, except for the five people who were burned alive inside. And the fire, didn't get the memo, burns down 60 adjoining structures, right? So the city, the mayor and the police department of Philadelphia burnt down a neighborhood in Philadelphia in the mid-80s. Okay. We start getting phone calls. I remember if we had a death case, I know we had injury cases, and we start getting phone calls. My father's office, my, my firm in Philadelphia, this is long before I'm, a, I'm in the firm, um, but I remember the story well. And many of the calls are for property damage. Now, we never, ever handle property damage. Somebody calls us up, I got rear-ended, and I got 10 grand in damage, and Geico won't pay. Like, I, I can't help you out. If there's an injury, that's different. Of course, I'll help you out as a by the way, but I can't get involved in property damage. My father says, wait a second. We're already taking the injury cases. We got like, like 50 calls for property damage. It's all one lawsuit. It's just a matter of adding additional names as the, as the plaintiffs. And if each case, that one's worth five, that one's worth 10, that one's worth 25, that one's worth 100, they add up, might as well take the property damage cases. For the first and only time in our firm's history, we take the property damage cases. We love all of our clients. Some we love even more. One of the clients is Ernest Bostic, lost all of his possessions in his girlfriend's apartment. He's a client. The property damage cases get assigned to a young lawyer in the firm named David. Happened to be an observant Jew, just as a by the way. And so his job is to put together the property damage cases, right? You can't just say, uh, okay, um, I lost a vase. Yeah, well, what, what kind of vase? Um, I'm pretty sure it was from the Ming Dynasty. It was worth like uh, four million. Okay, like, I mean, where's your receipt from Bed Bath & Beyond? Like, you got to show what you lose. Pictures, receipts, etc. So he's putting together the property damage cases. Okay, Ernest is calling him once every week to two weeks. What am I going to get my money? David says, listen, Ernest, okay, we have like... 50 cases of our own. There are another 200 cases. It's going to take a few years. You've got to be patient. Okay, it's the city of Philadelphia. It's not fast. Like, we filed a lawsuit. It's going to take time. Okay, the next week, when am I getting my money? Ernest, I told you last week, you've got to sit and be patient. When am I getting my money? One day, Ernest calls and he says, Okay, Dave, I settled my case. 
What are you talking about? He goes, I spoke to the assistant city, David says, the assistant city solicitor? So-and-so says his name, he goes, yeah, I spoke to him. I settled my case for 10 large, $10,000, get me my money. David says, you spoke to him? Yeah, okay, calls him up. He says, hey, it's Dave from Rothenberg's office. He goes, did you speak to my client, Ernest Bostick? The guy's like, oh no. He says, what? He says, Dave, I messed up. He goes, he called me directly, so I assumed that he was pro se, okay? Pro se is a Latin word. The literal translation means knucklehead, okay? I'm kidding. Pro se means self-represented. That's the person who says, you know what? I went to Home Depot and I built my own shed, so I can represent myself in a lawsuit. Don't do that, okay? But you're allowed to do it. You can represent yourself pro. He says, I assumed he was self-represented because he called me directly. I should have checked the list. Everybody who's ever watched a TV show knows you can't talk to somebody as a lawyer if they have a lawyer. Can't talk to you. He should have said, wait a minute, you're a Rothenberg client. I can't talk to you. He says, I'm so sorry I made a mistake. David says, listen, honest mistake. He says, he told me he settled his case with you. He's like, what are you talking about? I didn't settle the case. He goes, he said he settled his case with you. He told me he settled his case with you for $10,000. Can I send you a release? He says, I did not settle the case. He goes, oh no, what now? He says, whenever I have a pro se person, a self-represented litigant call me, I always ask them, how much are you looking for so I can mark it in my file? So I guess I asked them, how much are you looking for so I marked it down? David says, listen, okay? You should not have spoken to him. And not only did you speak to him, you had a miscommunication. He thinks he settled the case with you. Can I send you a release for 10 grand for this one case? He goes, Dave, I'm sitting here in City Hall. I got like seven levels of bureaucracy above me. I wouldn't even know where to go. Impossible. Absolutely impossible. There's no way you can make an exception for one case. He goes, no possible way. He goes, you know, in two years, we'll sit down. He says, before Excel spreadsheets, we'll have a graph, we'll have a chart. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out, right? He says, there's nothing I can do. Okay, Dave has to give Bostick the bad news. He calls him up. Ernest, there was a miscommunication. He just wanted to mark his file. The case is not settled. You have to be patient. Okay, Ernest Holt hangs up the phone and says, well, in that case, I'm going to go to City Hall and kill the lawyer. So he buys a gun with a sawed-off serial number, and he shows up in City Hall. The cops later have the sign-in sheet at City Hall. Ernest Bostick, in 12, 10 p.m. He sits in the waiting room for 20 minutes, out 12, 30 p.m. As he later told the cops, he got impatient. You know, where is he? He was out to lunch. So he said, you know what? I'll bet my lawyer's in cahoots with him. I'll go kill him instead. So he comes to our office. He knows which floor David's on, and it just so happens that as the elevator opens, David's walking by and they make eye contact, they recognize each other because Ernest had met him before when he came in to sign up the first time. And Ernest pulls the gun and David turns and starts to run and Ernest empties the gun, shoots him six times. Six entry wounds in his back, six exit wounds in his front. The police arrive before the paramedics. My father is in the back of the police paddy wagon holding David's head so it doesn't hit the metal floor of the van. They rush him into surgery with the chief trauma surgeon in Philadelphia in the closest trauma center who does 14 hours worth of surgery and saves his life. Saves his life, he's to this day, this is going back to the 80s, he is still alive and kicking and fine, okay. At the time, I'm around 18 or so. I am not yet going to yeshiva, I am not really serious about my Judaism, so it wasn't like I said, there's a mitzvah of Beaker Cholim visiting the sick. I was like, you know, the guy took six bullets, I met him a couple times in my parents' firm, it's a nice thing though, I'm gonna go to visit him. So I go to visit him. I get there, the only people there are his parents, like Harry, it was so nice of you to come, do you mind if we run out just to get some food? I'm like, no problem. So I'm just sitting, it's me and David. He's very, very weak. This is two days after taking six bullets. He says, um, I have to tell you a story. I have to like pull up a chair close just to even hear him. Okay. I was like, no, no, just rest, I'm just here to visit. He goes, no, I have to tell you a story. I'm like, okay. He says, um, yesterday the doctor who saved my life came to visit me and he introduced myself and I said to him like, what do I say to the person who saved my life? He says, I'm just doing my job. He says, but I want you to understand I never do this. He said, what do you mean? He says, I never visit anyone. He says, all I do are trauma surgery. Sometimes the person doesn't make it, they go to the morgue. Sometimes they survive and they're followed by another doctor. Like you're being followed by my colleague, Dr. So-and-so, right? Yes, he goes, but I had to make an exception. I had to come talk to you. He says, I don't know if you heard all the details yet. You took six bullets. One of them grazed your spinal cord. One of them grazed your heart. If they were any closer, you would have been paralyzed or you would have been dead. If you had moved differently, if you were wearing different clothing, anything would have changed the trajectory and you'd have been dead or paralyzed. Six bullets. So I just want you to know, young man, you had a guardian angel watching over you yesterday. And by the way, you're gonna be fine. And he was, he needed counseling, but physically, fine, okay? David's like, thank you. I'm like, wow, unbelievable story, okay? David says, he left. There was more to the story, but I didn't tell it to him because he's not Jewish, but I want, I want you to hear it. I'm like, yeah. He says, that morning, I got into my car, okay? I sometimes have to explain this for younger audience, but you'll know this, right? He goes, and I put the key in. Remember when you used to actually have to put a key into a car? You couldn't just like turn it on from your phone or by thinking, okay? He says, and I turned the ignition on and I put it in, in drive and I was about to pull away and all of a sudden I said to myself, wait a minute, 
did I put my tzitzes on today? Listen, I went like this and I was like, I don't believe it. I didn't put my tzitzes on today. He says, so I said to myself, Dave, you can go to work one day without your tzitzes on. Come on, okay? So again, I put my foot on the accelerator and then I said to myself, Dave, how can you go to work without your tzitzes on? So I put the car in park. I turned the key, turned it off. I took my seatbelt off. I went back into my house. I took my suit jacket off. I took my tie off. I took my shirt off. I put on my heavy wool pair of tzitzit. I put my shirt back on, my tie back on, my suit jacket back on, and I went to work. He goes, Harry, the doctor said, I was like, I got it. I got it. I heard the story. I know what the doctor said. Any change in your clothing, okay? I'm gonna tell you two things. Had you, at that time, when I heard the story, come over to me and done what the rabbis used to do in day school, hey, Herschel, how you doing? And give like the fake, you know, like, like little neck squeeze when they were really checking to see if I was wearing my tzitzis. They would do that all the time. <laughs> Drove me absolutely crazy. Could you please get your hands off me? I believe it's my decision. It's between me and God, okay? You would not have found any tzitzis. There's no question. Yarmulke, depending on the day and whether or not uh, I had a date or who I was dating or was going to a frat party, maybe it was on, maybe I had done the flip and it wasn't on. But tzitzis, there's no way I was wearing tzitzis after, you know, after I, it was mandatory in day school. No way. Since I heard that story, you can come check. You can come right now. Hey, Herschel, okay? And they're on. Unless I'm in the swimming pool or I'm in the shower. Okay, now. This is an extremely dangerous story. Why? Two reasons. Number one, there are women in the room, okay? Who might be feeling, well, wh why can't we get the Kevlar body armor? Like, can we start wearing tzitzis, all right? Number two, there are men in the room who are like, you know, um, I'm pretty sure there were some people killed, like, real recently in Israel who were wearing tzitzit, okay? They, by the way, you know how they say no atheists in the foxhole? They can't make enough tzitzit for the, shoulders, for the soldiers now. Everybody wants a pair, all right? So there have been people killed previously in terror attacks. Tree of Life Synagogue, it was during the services. Tzitzit, talus. They're in Harnof, there was a massacre of people who were wearing not just tzitzit, not just talus, but their tefillin were on. So I'm not telling you that if you wear tzitzit, you're Superman, you could just stand in front of bullets, okay? You could take at least six, right? I'm not telling you that. What I'm telling you is that to David, it was clear that that morning he did something extra for God and God did something extra for him. In my mind's eye, what I imagine is God saying to the angels, like, Mike, Gabe, Rafe, did, did you see what that guy just did? That guy just got undressed and redressed for me. I got his back today. Um, God, he's, uh, he's on the list. He, he's supposed to take six bullets today. Guys, I got his back today, okay? There's this doctor telling him, not a Jewish doctor, young man, you had a guardian angel watching over you, okay? And I ask you, and I'll finish with this, is it crazy to think that God may work that way? Okay, let's imagine the following, all right? I do a lot of travel. So I got my phone and I got my wheelie bag. That's what I got when I'm walking to the airport, okay? And I'm on my phone, which I shouldn't be. I should be looking where I'm going. But like, you know, most of humanity, we're not. We're on our phones and I'm checking the gate. I'm checking for my boarding pass, whatever it is, okay? And so imagine I'm on my phone, I'm wheeling my bag. And there's somebody else on his phone wheeling his bag, coming towards me, but his bag is coming right at me, right? And he hits me with his bag and I go flying. Now I get up, I turn around, and the guy looks at me and goes, you got a problem? Now, I don't know what it's like in Roslyn. I have no idea. I'm from Philly. That is a fist fight, okay? That guy's getting hit in the face, all right? Like, will you knock me down and you give me lip, okay? Now, imagine after I take care of him, I get on my flight, I get off my flight, I'm walking in my arrival airport, again, on my phone, and I'm wheeling my bag, okay? And some other knucklehead's not paying attention, hits me, and I go flying. And I'm thinking, like, what is going on today? Except this time, before I even get up, I got my fists ready. But this time, the guy turns and he's like, I'm so sorry, I'm such a klutz, I feel terrible, let me help you up. What am I gonna do? I'm not gonna hit him. At most, maybe I'm gonna say, just be more careful next time. Now, if you're watching those two scenes in a silent movie, there's no sound. You see me get knocked down, pound the guy. Then you see me get knocked down again, hey man, no problem. You're like, schizophrenia? Like, what is going on? What, bipolar? What is it? The answer is that I'm mirroring. The first guy was aching for a breaking. Cruising for a bruising, I gave it to him. The second guy acted appropriately, so I mirrored his actions. So why is it crazy to think that when God sees, right, look what that guy, look what that woman just did for me, I'm doing something extra for them. Versus, I always wonder about this. I have clients, most of the time, when they get to me, they've already had one surgery, two surgeries, and I'll be there you know, for surgeries, three, four, five, six, seven, once a guy, guy 23. And often clients will say to me, Jewish, non-Jewish, you're religious, right? Yes, okay. You know, I'm having a big surgery tomorrow, next week, et cetera. Can you pray for me? Absolutely. If they're Jewish, ask for the Hebrew name. And I'll say to them, you should pray also. And often they'll say, you know, I, I, I don't pray. I don't know how to pray. I don't pray. I say, just, you, you just pray. Like, you can, God, understand. I'm sure I have a good authority. He speaks every language, okay? Just pray. But I wonder, when that person prays for the first time, you know, and they're, they're 50 years old, and God's like, 
Have we met before? I'm not sure, do I know your name? That doesn't mean God's not gonna answer, right? But why is it crazy to think that if we do something, anything, whatever it is, there are so many different areas where we can do something extra. That's not why we should do it. We should do it because he told us to. But again, I have it on good authority. We do something extra for God. who we'll do something extra for us. And especially if ever there was a time in our lives to think about taking on something extra, now is the time. I will tell you that this, was, this had great resonance for me. My son is in yeshiva, and I was speaking to the head yeshiva of his yeshiva. And he said to me, I spoke to the Rosh Yeshiva in Passaic. There's a, there's a very, very well-known Rosh Yeshiva. And he said, and I said to him, Rosh Yeshiva, you know, who's, it's his Rebbe, you know, it was my son's Rebbe's Rebbe, what should I do? Should I talk to the guys about it? What do I tell them? And he said, don't say a word to them. They should see it in you that there's a difference. In other words, every kid in that yeshiva should see now, the rabbi is already a pretty holy guy. Like, what more can he do? Is he supposed to put on an extra pair of tzitzes? Should he put on an extra pair of tefillin? He understood what it meant. It meant that he should see an extra level of seriousness, okay? And I will tell you myself that I almost feel like, well, I, 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 this is like a new person I'm married to, okay? I've never, ever seen my wife like this before. Before her, her, her cousin's you know, kid went in, okay? Every extra minute, she's sing, sitting and saying to Tehillim and saying to Tehillim and saying to Tehillim, okay? You don't have to be a rabbi. You could be anybody. It could be Tehillim. It could be Tzedakah. It could be candle lighting. It could be a Friday night meal with your kids. It could be some extra Torah learning. It could be extra charity. There are endless the types of things that we can do. And so let's all think about that, take something on, and God willing, we'll have very good news soon, not just the release of the, the upcoming release of the hostages, but all of them, and hopefully the soldiers will be successful and come back safe. Thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed this, I do a short weekly video. It's on the Torah portion of the week, Parsha Shavua, or on the holidays. It's easy to find. Just go on YouTube, put in Harry's video blog, and I uh, hope you enjoy that. It's only three minutes long. You don't have to sit this long. And thanks again for coming, and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you.